Well, we're back in from the field now. We've collected our sample. The next thing we need to do is prepare the Petri dish. We've got a pad dispenser, nice and clean. Take that out of the packet inside. You see the, the arm is retracted. That's what it would look like if it's the wrong way around. What's the purpose of the pad dispenser? Pad dispenser allows us to put the pad, which holds the media, which is the food for the bacteria that we're look, trying to grow, um, without actually touching the pad because we don't want to contaminate it. So I'll take the lid off there and insert it that way round onto the top. And then we're ready to go. And it dispenses pads very simply. So this is one of our Petri dishes. We sterilised that earlier, you remember. I'm just going to dispense a pad into the middle, ready for us to put some media on. Jeff, what happens if we haven't got a pad dispenser? Well, we want to make sure that the pads remain sterile, so we can use a pair of forceps. If we flame the tips, just to make sure that we kill anything that might be transferred, and then without touching the ends, we can very simply take a simple single pad, And drop that into the petri dish in exactly the same way. And then it's the same process with the media. The process is identical to the media from there. And again, remember nice red media that we made earlier. What we're going to do is we're going to take a sterile pipette, holding it with the end that end, not that end, because we don't want to contaminate that as well. How much media does it take per petri dish? Between two and two and a half millilitres, each pad is very slightly different in terms of the amount that it's going to suck up. So you really need to kind of do it by eye. But very simply, in a circular motion, so there's complete saturation and it's starting to soak around the edges. What happens if there are bubbles? Bubbles are no good. Bubbles are going to cause a barrier between the membrane and the food. And then you're not going to get the bugs growing. And that's going to cause a problem with the result later on. If you do end up with bubbles, there's two ways in which you can get rid of them. The first is to stab them with the end of your pipetta. That will get rid of the very large bubbles, but you'll notice it doesn't get rid of very many. So, first thing you need to do is squeeze the end of your pipette and suck the bubbles out much like a vacuum cleaner. If you find you run out of squeeze, squeeze again and suck them out. Until you're bubble free. And that plate is now ready for the membrane. Now we're ready to start processing the microbiological samples. What we'll need obviously is our sample water filters, the petri dishes that we prepared earlier, the filtration manifold, the vacuum pump, a lighter and the forceps, and a chinograph pencil to mark up the sample after we finish processing it. The first stage is to get the filtration manifold set for filtration. Turn the head upside down and insert it onto the vacuum cup, and then turn the cuff around to the point whereby you can easily take, remove the two and hold them in one hand. Replace it on top of the uh, filtration manifold in order to ensure that the inside doesn't become contaminated. As you start to assemble the sterilized filtration manifold, on occasions the black rubber o-ring prevents the filtration manifold head from sitting into the vacuum cup. A good way to alleviate that is ensuring that you press evenly across the base of the vacuum cup, push it on and turn it slightly. That should create enough suction to hold the head on. The next stage is to ensure that our forceps are sterile, slightly flame those, and while there's a cooling we can get set with a filter. Peel the two corners apart, peeling the clear plastic film uh, down the front and the white opaque backing down the back. You'll notice that there is the filter on the bottom 
which is white and gridded, and on top of it it's protected by a blue paper layer. So we don't use the blue paper? No, it's non-porous. Uh, it's only there really to protect the filter itself. You'll notice on the top of the filter as you peel back the blue paper, there is a gridded sequence. That's in order to be able to assist you when you're counting in the analysis of the samples. Very carefully and gently grip the filter by the edge, ensuring that you don't try and crease or bend it. As gently as you possibly can, place the filter gridded side up into the middle of the filtration manifold brass disc. Okay. Now rotate the locking cuff to ensure that the filter is held, the funnel is held in the vacuum position. Okay, taking our sample water and filling it to the 100 mil line, which is the top of the two uh, white scored marks on the actual funnel. Insert the vacuum pump into the side port and then gently squeezing the pump itself you'll notice that it starts to pull the water through as part of a vacuum. Is it important for that to be quite slow? The turbidity of the water, which we previously analysed, will have an impact on it. However, the, if you go too fast, there are certain likelihoods where you'll cause the filter to either rumple or crease, uh, and then sometimes you can end up with mild compromises of the filter, in which case you'd need to run that process again. Okay, as the water starts to pull through and get nearer to the end of the filtration, you'll start to see the surface of the water evaporate away from the filter. It's important not to suck too much air through the filter after it's finished back the um, suction. Okay. Remove the vacuum pump, and again, ensuring that our tweezers are sterile because we don't want to be introducing contamination from the tweezers. Release the locking cuff to the point whereby, again, it's easy to lift both off in one hand. Gently remove the filter from the top of the brass disc. Again, being very careful to hold it only by the edge. Place the filter funnel and cuff back on, and then rolling it from one side to the other in order to try and prevent air bubbles, place the filter on top of the saturated pad, ensuring that they overlap as exactly as is possible, so you don't end up with overlapping edges. Place the lid on the Petri dish, mark the sample with the China Graph pencil, and return it into the stack. Okay, the first thing to do at this stage is to turn the incubator on in order to give it some time to run up to temperature. Ensuring that at least half an hour has passed since you finished processing the last sample, take your Petri dishes, slide them to keep them flat so that the media doesn't wash the uh, filters and pads too much to a point whereby you can stack them neatly on top of the others. Why the half an hour? In order to allow the bacteria which have just gone through the process of being filtered time to recover. If they went straight into the incubator there's a possibility that the shock might do them no good and you'd end up with a uh, false report. Try and keep the stack of Petri dishes as upright as you can and gently slide them into the strap. Don't force the Petri dishes through the strap, you'll end up catching edges around the side of the Petri dish uh, and tearing them which makes them very difficult to get into the 
incubator chamber itself. I notice you've got empty ones in there as well. Why is that? Because the incubator unit works on conduction of heat rather than convection of heat. If there weren't the empty Petri dishes in, you wouldn't get an even distribution of heat through the uh, incubation chamber. Place them into the top of the incubator unit, return the lid. In the circumstance whereby using a dual unit, there are two principal advantages. One, or well, the most common advantage, is the fact that it allows you to simultaneously incubate for total coliform as well as isolating by temperature for thermotolerant coliforms, which reduces your analysis time. The other advantage is if you want to incubate both chambers at the same temperature, it gives you added capacity. Ensure that both incubator units have been turned on, the power light is showing, and the temperature light has extinguished, showing that the incubator chamber has come up to temperature. Simply, as before, remove the lid from the incubator, ensuring that there's been half an hour's rest between processing of last sample and the start of the incubation period. Place inside the incubation chamber as follows, ensuring that the lid fits neatly back on top of the incubation chamber. So how long would you incubate for? For both the single and the dual incubator units, the incubation period should be for 16 to 18 hours.